Oh, there he goes, retirement. I don't know about that word retirement, but I've never worked hard in my life. And <laughs> yeah, what's it like in the, in the uh, RBL? That's good. Um, it's been a bit of a learning curve for me. Um, I had to sort of learn all the admin side, uh, the work on a computer, sending emails and all that sort of stuff. I, you know, when, when I started, I, I never done anything like that before in my life. Um, <laughs> The computer was just used for the tap on to get on to read and to see what ride they had coming up. To build a form, but that's, that's all changed and I'm, I'm still learning. Um, but most of the time, uh, I, I, I do, like mostly, is going to the races and watching my friends drive and, and see how they're going. And that's sort of what I know best. And uh, also representing them in the steward room and things like that if they need to, need to be on the day. How did you arrive at uh, what would have been a pretty difficult decision? You'd written for 35 years. How did you come to that decision? It's something that I've, I always wanted to do and I thought it would be a great job and that I would enjoy um, once I did stop writing. Um, look, I could have kept writing for a couple more years, but at the time that job came up and that job doesn't come up very often and I had to think about it where I was at my career at the time, and I thought it's probably time to do it. Oh, well, let's go back to the start, uh, throwing up. Uh, how did you get involved in the racing uh, game? We know your brother Mick was a was a jockey, uh, but how did you get involved in it? I um, got involved in it through my brother Mick. Um, we weren't any uh, racing family, so to speak, at all. Um, my brother Mick. I'm sure that he was probably born with a whole guy in his hand. <laughs> Honestly, he uh, wanted to be a jockey since day dot. So that's what he wanted to do, and that's what he did. Uh, he started his apprenticeship at Caulfield with a trainer called Don Shannon. Michael is about five years older than myself, and so what happened was I started in Michael's footsteps in a way where he used to play soccer, and I, as a career, always wanted to do something to do with sport when I was young. And like most kids, I was either playing football or soccer, but mainly soccer. I, I used to play for a club called Broadmeadow City. I used to love, I used to love playing soccer. I, 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 to think about it, it was always a laugh because everybody in soccer is called Ala Joey. <laughs> and my friend over here called me one day, you run like a Mercedes with a flat tire. <laughs> How good were you as a soccer player? Because I've I got it on good authority that you were very good, and you might have even made that as a career, not as a jockey. Actually, I was pretty good. Uh, <laughs> I was pretty good, You're right, Mark? <laughs> no, I actually won best and first in the club three years in a row. One of three seasons I played. Um, then I was picked to play in the Victoria State side. Um, during that period, in about six months, um, they all grew. <laughs> And I didn't. I was running around a pitch at about 28 kilograms. <laughs> so when they kicked the ball at me, hit my foot and really tipped over. So it was getting a little bit difficult for me. And during the off season, my brother Mick was at the stables at Caulfield. He said, why don't you come down on the weekend? And my brother was always a step ahead of me, too smart for me, you know, like older brothers are. <laughs> he had me mucking out his boxes on the morning at 3.30. So that went on for a while. And then I started learn to ride the basics on a pony that's a stable pony. And once I learned to ride a little bit, I was hooked. Um, I think I still hold the record from leaving, well, I, I, I live in Glenroy, I've got a five children, and I, I think I hold the record for leaving on a Friday afternoon when the bell went at Cork, uh, Glenroy Tech, to get to my locker and get to the train and catch the train to Caulfield. There's no more money for the favourite either. <laughs> yeah. So did your family support you in your quest to be a jockey? They did. Mum and Dad. Um, at the time, Michael was already, already apprenticed and I, I explained and Mum and Dad realised that's what I wanted to do was be a, a jockey. And they made the move from Glenroy to Portfield. And at the age of 14, I was able to ride track work in the morning, 
Um, my morning started at 3.30 and I'd go to school and then after school, come back after school and do the afternoon work. But going to school wasn't that bad. I, I, I uh, did most of my sleeping in school. <laughs> I only had six months to go before I come of age where I could leave school. So how did you get involved with the, um, the trainers? Like, when did you talk down there with Mick and did he introduce you to the trainers or how did that come about with the uh, introduction to Frank King? Who was uh, the master of uh, Darren for many years? He was. Um, at the time, I was working with my brother called Don Shannon. Uh, Don Shannon retired from training and went back to the North. So the job was offered to um, come about with, I, I approached Frank King, and at the time, he had Dale Shorter with um, a leading apprentice who'd just come out of his time. So Frank was looking for another apprentice. And Frank was renowned to be like king of the kids, like uh, Theo Green in Sydney. So I was fortunate enough to have a great boss like Frank King. Um, he was tough, uh, but he was very fair and uh, really looked after me. But your early career, I mean, you had so many winners. You just burst onto the scene like we've never seen anybody. And Roy Higgins was basically at the end of his career. He only had another year and a half or so to go before he retired. But you burst on the scene. What was that like when you all of a sudden were running, riding winner after winner? And how did you, how did the other trainers, like, how did they start putting you on? How did that happen? Well, when I started, it all, it all began very quick. Um, I like my, when I first started, my first couple of rides ran second last, and my third ride was a winner. Uh, but then it was this slow, gradual process where I was riding a lot of, lot of winners in the South Gippsland area. Um, I was three claim kilogram claim apprentice in the country at the time, and that sort of snowballed me into going into the metropolitan area. And I had a pretty good grounding. Um, my boss, Frank King, held me back a little bit during that time just to make sure I was really ready to go into the metropolitan area. And once that happened, I had the support of like trainers that I rode work for, quite a bit of call for the basic call for, such as uh, Jeff Murphy, Angus Harmonesco. So, a lot of the time, when I did make that um, transition to come to the metropolitan area with a full kilogram claim, I had the support. And I think, Lee, during that time, I think I rode, had this amazing run, and it's not just about jockey's ability, I was getting on the right horses, I was getting the right opportunities, but you still have to make the most of those opportunities, as you know, Mark. And, I had a run up there when I was right, right, 18 consecutive meetings in the metropolitan area where I rode 40 winners. So that really snowballed me into like the upcoming spring. The spring was right around the corner. And throughout that spring carnival, the first spring carnival I rode, I had that same support, which I was very fortunate. And I ended up riding horses on my first major day at Flemington on Derby Day. I had five rides, one was for Bath. One was for um, Jeff Murphy, uh, George Hallen, uh, Bob Hollyfield, and I ended up riding three winners and rode my first group one, one winner on a horse called River Rough. So, and during that week, I was lucky enough that Bart put me on a horse called Tiger Eclipse in the Oaks, and I won the Oaks as well. So, when I rode the Oaks winner, that was my 60th winner, um, and that was the end of my claim. You were 17, is that right? I was 17 years old, so I had another four years to go with my apprenticeship and drive a better claim, but that was a very important part leading into the Spring Carnival for me because it sort of showed that I can compete without my claim and, um, and I'm very fortunate. When did you catch the attention of the uh, Friedman clan? Because you, you were associated with a very good filly called Sauna, which, which you won numerous races on. I did. Um, I remember the first day at Caulfield and first time I ever met Lee um, and Lee came into the jockey's room and he said to me, one of the first things he said to me, this will win. I've never seen Lee in my, Lee in my life. But he just looked at me and said straight away, this will win. If you ride it right. <laughs> She went straight to the front, wasn't she? <laughs> <laughs> jumping around, wasn't she? Yeah, she was a jumping around, and to be honest, I walked out to the mountain yard and I looked at the horse when it came in, I thought, wow, this looks like a horse being just trained by Bart. And the horse won, only won by seven lengths. <laughs> <laughs> so it was too well right. And, uh, and then 
I had a relationship, uh, you know, I was these main writers, you know, families writer for quite a while, and that's when I got to know Anthony, Richard, and Michael, and uh, they all been part of my career and gave me a hand and copped a fair few sprays off Anthony, of course. <laughs> <laughs> One day he did give me a pep talk, and I think I wrote five winners that day. <laughs> And we asked for his percentage. <laughs> now, around that time, around 82, 83 time, it might have been a little bit late, 80, late 83, 84, you were like a rock star in Melbourne. Like, we had two famous, um, two famous celebrities, I mean, racing people were Bill Collins, who was very famous, and also uh, Roy Higgins. They would have been the two biggest, but then you came along and you were the third one because back then racing was so big. I mean, it's big now, but it, was, it seemed to be so huge back then. You were even, where you met your lovely wife, Karen, on Young Talent Time. You were on Young Talent Time on the cover of every magazine and all, on every TV show, so everyone wanted a piece of you. What was that feeling like? <laughs> well, in those days, they used to call me the Golden Hands. I thought it was the wanker. <laughs> I remember that period of time when uh, my boss, Frank Kim, you know, I had a few shows, I was on Hot Bottle. I was asked to go on the Don Lane show, show, which I went on, and then I went on this show, and then a show, and then the boss said to me, go on Young Talent Time. I said, no, boss, you're not doing that to me. I did watch Young Talent Time, oh, maybe once. The boss, made me go on Young Talent Time. And I knew a few of the, the performers on it, you know, the, 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 the weekly one, and, uh, like Ken Arena, Joey Pepperoni. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. And uh, I remember in the green room when I put the makeup on, you know, I was sitting there and Tina come up, hi Tina, how are you? Lovely to meet you. And Joey, how are you, Joey? Just sat down and then Carol walks in and I thought, wow, she look a bit alright, mate. <laughs> and then Katie, Katie Van Reed, and uh, nothing sort of happened, you know. You know, I didn't get flu out of Carol. It was just a bit disappointing. Um, I had a little incident one day, I was riding that stand down and a horse from New Zealand, which turned out to be a really good horse trained by Rick or Lacey was having his first start, a horse called Fox Hill. And he was a big horse and I was in the barriers and the horse took a nose dive and got through the front of the barriers and then broke my collarbone on the shoulder and um, just a bit of publicity about that and one of the young talent time girls rang me to see how it was, it was Katie Van Ree. Um, and I was talking to Katie for a while and Going through my head, uh, where are you, Katie? You're, you're dancing in China. Yeah, it's Karen there. <laughs> <laughs> this is a long time after you appeared on the Young Television. It wasn't long, about six months after. So it took a while. And it's like, you know, I was talking to Karen and I was pretty shy. You know, I was real, I was really shy and then Karen asked my number. So <laughs> Did I ask for your number? <laughs> and that's, how, that's how it all started. So um, that's our relationship. You know, now we've got four children. Um, we're still married. We're all happy. That's it. Karen <laughs> was well known for her singing and her dancing on Young Talent Time. But Darren, I did a bit of homework and they tell me that you're a bit of a Frank Sinatra yourself. <laughs> And you've got a few duets with uh, with Karen, is that right? Over the time in restaurants? Is that true? Oh, yes. sure not. I can't remember. That's <laughs> <laughs> right. In Hong Kong, you might have been seeing in bars and restaurants. Maybe in Hong Kong, mate, but it would have might have been late at night when uh, <laughs> drinks. Fair enough. Well, let's get back to the uh, you know the support early on from the trainers that you received. I mean, Freeman's come on board. You had the, uh, the Caulfield trainers, but then you got the, um, the relationship going with the Hay Stable. Brent Thompson had gone overseas to ride in England, and they cre created an opportunity for you to ride for them. What was that like? That was amazing. Um, I was 18 years old, and uh, so happened, things happened pretty quick at that time, and 
when I was offered the job at uh, Hayes, number one, um, it was the best job in Australia at the time. And of course I took it. And I was still apprentice to Frank King. I rode and I had a lot of success with um, the Hayes family. Uh, they were very good to me. I learned quite a bit from riding for Hayes. I remember one day I rode at Flemington, I rode three winners for Hayes and we won the main race like the Winter Championship and I, was, I lived at my boss's place, Frank King's house and it was like a curfew every night at the year by 8.30. So I remember walking in after Saturday races, it was a good day and Frank turned around and said to me, well done today, you rode really well, um, that's the last day you ride for the Hayes family. And uh, he says, he said to me, I said to him, why, why? Oh, he said, well, you're not ready for it, for one. Um, I think you're riding better before when you're freelancing. And after a while, I look back on it. Um, it's not the best decision my boss ever made for me. I was too young to take that type of job, and that's sort of responsibility on. And even though it was a great learning curve, uh, we left on good terms and I continued to ride for Hayes and ride many winners from over the years. Uh, like, they, they are a wonderful racing family, so I'm very grateful for that experience anyway. But at that stage you'd already had two premierships to your name, so it was a bit of a... I remember the press saying it was a, such a strange decision to give up such a lucrative um, position. It was, um, but like I said, at the time, I, I, you know, when I look back, I was... My boss was looking after me, um, and Frank decided, well, he, he, he needed changes to me, and I, I didn't realise that straight away. And it did make a little bit of difference to my riding. Um, I felt like I was riding under pressure. I was just too young to take on that job, for, for one, and, um, as I was saying before. Well, most of your career you rode as a freelance, but you have had another association with the Hay Stable plus the Hawk Stable. What were they like? They were good. Um, it was a good stable. I rode for John for over 12 years, and he's a great trainer. He's a, he's a very good trainer, and they were very good to me. Um, Ryan had gotten you cop any sprays, but one thing I always respected John about, he will give me a spray, and that's over and done with. Let's get on with the next race. And um, I'm, I learned a lot more for John, and like I said, they're, they're still going strong now. That, but the period I was going through was when uh, the women were their main owners and only owners, really. Uh, they were wonderful people. And so I got very fortunate to be sort of involved in that. I wrote many group one winners for them and um, went on to win some more premierships. So it was, it was really good. Well, now we're talking about uh, the full series colours, but how can we forget the uh, one of the best horses we've ever seen, one of the best milers in Lonro. What was he like to sit on? You only had a couple of uh, goes on him, but you ended up winning both races. What was he like? He was a, he was a lovely horse, Long Road. He's one of those horses, when you look at, you say, wow, what a beautiful looking animal. And I'll tell you something, when you get on his back, straight away you feel, well, power. He was just giving the wow factor straight away. It's, it's like riding a normal horse sitting on a stool and jumping on him sitting on and laying on the couch. He was just a magnificent animal. Um, he was probably the closest to the best horse I've rode um, in his turn of foot in the race. It was just amazing. He, he, you could be back second last for midfield in the race and he's one of those horses. With his turn of foot, he just gets you out of trouble or his turn of foot was that explosive you go from there, probably hit the front too soon. And there's only one other horse that could do that, was probably superimposed. How would uh, Monroe and, oh, I'll mention superimposed, and the other two horses I want to mention as well was El Segundo and Shaftesbury Avenue, which probably doesn't get the accolades he deserves, Shaftesbury Avenue, ran third in the Japan Cup, which was, I think was a little bit unlucky in that race. But, you, but these are all these four horses, they're all very good milers. How would they compare against a horse like today, like Wings? I know it's difficult to compare different eras, but how would they go? I, well, it is very hard, and it's probably unfair to compare. Um, but tell you what, that's you better run for, a, for a money. You know, look, look, look at a horse like what, um, Superimposed. How many horses will you see with back-to-back Epsons, two Epsons, and two Doncasters back-to-back? It's pretty hard to do, and I don't think I'll ever see them. 
he provided you with your uh, probably your bit of heartbreak in the Melbourne Cup when running second to the uh, the stable mate from the Freeman stable in Terrific. But I believe you had a chance, an opportunity to ride uh, Terrific. I did, Mark. Um, I had to make a decision pretty early, and it was probably about three weeks before the race. Um, at the time, uh, Superimpose was going great, and Terrific was probably going so so at, to his standard and wasn't sure whether it was going to be out going okay for the Melbourne Cup or not. And oh, we knew one thing that Terrific would run the two mile, where Superimpose was probably vulnerable. Um, I was riding both horses work right up to the last gallop and I remember remember their last gallop at Flint on the course proper. They, they both ran exactly the same time, over the same distance, basically. And I remember coming to Leah said, Leave can I change? He goes, no mate, still. <laughs> but Saturday I was like uh, Derby Day that Barry draws done for Melbourne Cup and superimposed through a great barrier, a really nice barrier, and I thought, well, I know what I'm going to do now. So I just put him to sleep the whole race. He was running about six on the fence, and just, it, it's a beautiful horse to ride. He's, he's a push button, he's just going to pull him, just go to sleep, or go when you'll go. And I remember coming to the, uh, about the 800 meter mark at Flemington, and I was back on the fence, probably three pairs back on the fence or whatever, and, and things just happened right for him. You know, one of those things, one of those races where everything goes right. And I was able just to creep up behind Cooch, who was in front in the Melbourne Cup, leading, turning for home. And I thought, I was just jogging, I was absolutely just jogging. And I thought, this is my first Melbourne Cup, just don't panic, don't go too soon. Uh, like Joey, so I just sat, sat played and waited. So I remember when I had the opportunity just to peel outside Cooks at the 300 metre mark, and I went, boom, go. He showed his usual turn of foot, but only lasted for about 50 metres. He just couldn't run the two mile out. I could see a horse coming down the outside, and I didn't take any notice what horse was coming down the outside, actually. I was just thought, well, there's one that's going to beat me. But I was still proud of the horse before he's done a fantastic job to run second, you know, being a champion he is. And I think when I looked up the second time and he was terrific, I yelled out something at the top of my voice, sound like a pro. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was terrific. But I tell you what, that was an amazing effort by the Freeman family that year. That sort of put them all on the market because it was a team effort. And uh, that's including you too, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, to run to, to win out the Melbourne Cup was a great effort. And uh, the stewards did have a quiet word to me after the race and said, well, we're going to let you off this time because we probably fell for you. So they gave me a free kick. Well, that was the second place in the Melbourne Cup you had. Your first one was in 84 with Chagamar. You probably thought, after running second, you probably thought, I've got plenty of time to win a Melbourne Cup, but it's just not that easy to win, as it's been proven, and you've finished third as well on, on a journey, which seemed un unlucky a few years back. Yes, I did. Um, I reckon I should have won a Melbourne Cup that year. Um, it's when Matthew Gazebo won her third Melbourne Cup. Anthony's not happening. Yeah, I And, uh, well, I probably would have spoiled the party. But, I thought, my honest opinion, if I had a vote on a journey in a lead up race to the Melbourne Cup, I would have won. I would have made a horse a bit better. Um, just one of those things. I, I, I wrote to my instructions, and the plan was just to rock, try and run the first 10. And top of the straight, I thought, well, everything's going okay here. And, I was behind, no, before the home turn, I was behind, actually behind the winner, Mackie Dia. Um, but behind her, when she went, she left me sort of flat footed and just put a gap in me and myself. And I was told to just try to get the horse clear the lane, don't go looking for runs, she's not a stop start type of horse. And so I come out and I made a run for top of straight well, I reckon I'm going to run the first 10. About the 100 metre mark, I thought, well, I'm going to run the first five, I'm going to do better. <laughs> And it wasn't until like the last dying stage, the last 20 or 30 minutes in the race, so I ran in the second. You just kept down the same pace where everything else stopped. But 
Who knows? Look, uh, if they had to go outside and make it even really challenge there, champion years, you'd probably still beat me, but I reckon I would have made it very interesting. <laughs> well, you had, uh, you had 35 years in the saddle. You rode two and a half thousand winners. But not all of that was uh, was fun. There was plenty of uh, nasty falls. And uh, we'll talk about the Yarra Glen one in 1992, where you were laid motionless on the track for many. For those of us that were there, it was such a really uh, scary uh, position to be. And I'm sure your wife remembers that, how, how dangerously close you were losing your life in and out of um, a coma. Must have been really frightening. It was. Um, what actually happened was, I was actually having a good day at Gary Glen. It was stinking hot. Um, it was a hot day. And I already rode two winners. And I was on a horse that was pretty well fancy. And the horse was called Strike the Gong. The poor name. But uh, I remember, all I remember was I was just coming around the home third and I was just behind the leaders. And I just come out of three wide lane. And I thought I was just going to win. And I get the horse to pick me. He actually done a left hand turn real quick. I think it was ducking real quick. And I only just touched the horse in front of me shield and it just speared me head first into the ground. The horse fell and a couple went over the top of me and kicked my skull cap off. And the result was I woke up eight days later in the hospital and I didn't know what happened. And it was a bit scary because at that time I thought I was more worried about if I had a car accident and it had someone been in the car with me, I thought, I had no idea. And when they said they had a race, well, I was like, oh, that's a relief. So, I uh, did not be around a bit. But I, I was pretty fortunate. I had the right people behind me, right doctors, and I was able to come back riding after like two and a half years and um, continue on. When that happens, do you ever doubt yourself when you go out there that you start worrying that you might have another fall? Does that come into your head? It's sort of, look, uh, we're all human, and you do think that way in a sense, but it sort of didn't really worry me at all because I really couldn't remember it. Um, I, I sort of fall after that, and um, it just sort of didn't worry me. That's part and parcel of racing, and to be a jockey, that's what you've got to accept. You know, that's that's going to happen, and in all walks of life, anything can happen now. So it's just one of those things, you know, and uh, it sort of never really worried me. Another, another couple of falls that you did have did cost you some big races, or maybe one of them was the Victoria Derby octagonal on the morning in the Carbine Club. You had an injury at the, um, well, you received an injury at the, in the barriers before the first race. Yeah, what, what, what happened was I was riding octagonal in the um, Derby. I had a good book of riding in the day, and the first ride I had was um, at Fleming the horse called On Course in the Carbine Mile, 1600 metres. And going to the first turn, the horse, which in front of me just cut me pretty fine, took the tails, I hit the deck and I thought I was okay. Uh, next minute, um, there was blood pouring out of my groin. And the first thing I did was just check to see if everything was all right down there, you know what I mean? <laughs> but uh, um, I couldn't continue on because I ended up going, oh, the end result was I ended up in hospital having been stitched up all over the place. and. Uh, I, um, I looked like a black fella down there after that. I pretty well bruised. I missed out on the right off panel. Um, uh, that's part and part where I did it happen. And the other one was uh, in 1985 where you were due to ride Rory's Jester in the Golden Slipper, but you had another fall just before the race, or a week before the race, leading up. Yeah, well, that was my fault. No, I had my own fault totally that. Um, I was riding a horse for Bart at Ballarat and approaching the home turn, the horse broke his leg. A uh, horse never broke his leg before on me, and it's the first time it felt like it was going to fall. It really felt like it was going to fall over, and I got down to a slow can and I thought, well, I reckon it's going to fall over, this thing, I'm going to jump off. And I jumped, and I actually my foot got caught up in my eye. And I landed a little bit awkward, so I didn't look at the pain, so I took it to the hospital and they said to me, you've got a broken rib. I said, well, I said, look, I've got this ride on Saturday in the slip and I think it's a win. But Rory's just up there. <laughs> so the doctor said, well, okay. He says, we can get a way right around it, we can give you a tablet, take this tablet for four of the races, but only have the one ride. I said, no, that's fine. 
So I got in my car and I was driving home and I had to get petrol and my stomach was getting bigger and I had nothing to eat all day. And I got out of the car and I didn't lose a pain, a bit more pain actually, and couldn't even undo the petrol cap. I, I ended up managing to do it, got the petrol, got home and I was just busting to go to the toilet and piss and when I did it just pissed blood. <laughs> so I had a bruised kidney, so oh. I uh, did hospital for three weeks. So you guys another one of the group one. Now, <laughs> Sandown was another bad fall when the seagulls, I don't know if anyone saw it, but there was a stack of seagulls on the track and many jockeys came down. That would have been pretty scary, looking at the seagulls coming towards you and all the horses veering all over the place. I've never uh, been in a race. It was the weirdest feeling I've ever experienced. Um, what happened was I picked up a ride on the day in this particular race for uh, Cliff Brown and I was well back in the field but I was going pretty easy. I knew the horse pretty well. I uh, watched him race and he's got a very good finish and I thought I'm a chance here and I was just travelling that well but was more, when, you're, when you're riding the race you're more concentrated on the horse directly in front of you. Right? And every now and then you look up to see where the rest of the field is just to make sure they're not too far away or whatever. Um, and I was back in the field and I was travelling really well and that's what happened. I looked, looked at the horse in front of me and then I, then I looked up and it was like, all I could see in front of me was just like that ceiling white. It was just pure white. I could not see a horse. All I could see was dots going, black dots going, ting, ting, ting. No, actually the horses. Next minute. <laughs> I was, um, the horse must have went that way and I'd keep going straight, I didn't even know, I just couldn't feel the horse underneath me, I just went back to the ground. And it was just a, that many seagulls that blocked in front of the field as we straightened up for home. You, you couldn't see nothing bar white, I think about five or six just come down that day. And a real nasty fall you had a few years after that, I think it was about five years later at Mornington, which was probably, as long as Yarra Valley was your uh, scariest fall. Yeah, it was uh, the scary fall because it was in a 2400 metre race and uh, Mornington, you had to do a lap and a half to Mornington basically. And I had rode the horse before and the horse was pretty good to ride and I knew him pretty well. Um, when the barriers opened, I sort of found my spot and was going to the first turn, like I had straight the first time. And for some reason, I couldn't work out why the horse just wouldn't make the turn. It was heading straight for the outside rail, and I had no control. And in the end, I sort of I had no hope of steering him. I thought this horse is going to go through the outside rail. On so I just tried to use my body weight. And fortunately enough, when I did that, he changed, strike and went left and went back into the field, but we're actually going into the middle of the field, like straight at it. And it was a bit scary. <laughs> and I realised then that the horse had a heart attack. I knew then. And amazingly enough, as I was going through the field, into it, he hit another horse and bounced off it and hit the rail, threw me in the air, and I, I hit the ground like I, I was facing the opposite way to where I was going. As, I, as like I was doing up the shoelace. And as soon as I hit the deck, I knew well, I broke my back, I was actually And the horse died, of course, so I dropped dead. And the pain was unbelievable because I actually crushed a vertebrae and broke the one above it and had a bruised aorta. The, the strangest feeling was actually a bruised aorta because it's like someone was suffocating me the whole time. Um, I was off the I put me out for a good 10 months. And you still rode after that? Like, you must have had doubts after that last fall. No, look, I said horses do that fall with me. Um, it didn't, look, it didn't really worry me uh, that much at, at all. Um, so, you know, the thing is, is that I was, I was fortunate enough not to have an operation for one. And at that time, I thought, my back doesn't feel or I can't ride the same way, that's when I'll probably give up. And luckily enough it didn't and I was able to continue riding. Well you've had such a, an amazing, you had such an amazing career, so much success, as I said earlier, 35 group one winners, two and a half thousand winners overall. Are there any regrets? 
Of course. Uh, <laughs> of course. Apart from when you know when you know Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, 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 of course. I would have loved it when I got Melbourne Cup. Uh, my regrets are, uh, look, it's been not that many regrets. Look, racing overall has been fantastic to me. Um, it sent me uh, plenty of places around the world where I probably wouldn't have gone to. Um, met a lot of people, a lot of good friends. Um, I would have been met. Um, including my wife, uh, my family, so look up. Even though we have loved one of the Melbourne Cup, I've uh, checked in the Caulfield Cup, I've got people in the three chicken and the top plate. That's the way it goes. There are quite a few group ones, but none of the feature ones, but I think, like I said, I've been fortunate enough to have a happy career. <laughs> well, um, we've heard you today talk about your career. Is anything going to be put in writing soon? I believe there might be something coming out shortly. Is that right? I mean, I've heard something over there before. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> and I believe there's a is it a special for Dream Thoroughbred owners? They get a discount. <laughs> <laughs> So will there be um, any saucy stories in the uh, book that we should know? Oh, uh, the dressing. That's in there as well. Did you actually know what's in there? No, the book will be out in um, October. Um, I have read the book. Kristen <laughs> Manning wrote the book. She's done an amazing job. Um, it's all about, of course, my, my family. And is there anything about that you're like, ah, oh, it's Yeah, yes. Yeah, actually, there's a nice little picture of the stereo on him. <laughs> that's where I used to sit. That's where I was modelling in front of the stereo when I first got it. And that, the grass here, the, the mullet. The mullet. Yeah, the mullet. <laughs> And had the multi jumper on too. Well, Darren, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you today. One of the, not only one of the nicest blokes in racing that's ever been, but a, a true champion. Would you please put your hand together for Darren? Gale.